to the workshop where we're going to teach you how to create and implement an effective data governance policy. Hey, that worked. Okay. My name is Eugenia Moore, and as you can see, I'm very nervous. <laughs> uh, so bear with me. I'm a manager, I have to look up my title. Uh, I'm a manager of the data governors and quality at PIPA Digital Labs. Yes, it's a funny name, but it's actually a company of Ajo Deles, USA. We're all about groceries, <laughs> hence the shape of the body. Um, I've been with the company for about two years, and I was lucky enough to participate, or actually play an important role in creating and implementing seven data governance policies. So I'm here to share my experience and my struggles as a newbie, and I hope we, you know, to make your experience a little bit easier. When I was picking the title to talk about today, I actually tried to find a title that's not spoken often at the conferences, and this was the one I picked. Now, I was very excited when I chose it, and I shared you know, my thought with a colleague who speaks at these conferences quite often, and his reply to me was, do you know why nobody speaks about policies? I'm like, no. Well, they're not fun. They're not sexy. I'm like, really? Which part of data governance is fun or sexy, right? <laughs> so now, but it, it's equally important, and the data governance policies are the key to the success of the data governance program within your organization. But let me introduce you my co-speaker with a radio voice that hopefully you get to know, know and like, Neil Wilt. Hi, good morning everybody. My name is Neil Wilt. Um, I was, uh, well, obviously, phonetically blessed with two verbs for a name, but nevertheless, um, I joined Peapod Digital Labs about a year ago. Uh, it was right at the point that we were rolling out these freshly created policies and everything else. So throughout this time, we've also moved into the governance and, and basically review phase of a lot of these policies. So uh, it's been a great learning experience for me. Um, I have spent 20 years on the IT security side. This is my first foray into a business type role. Um, but the beauty of it is what I found with data governance is having a nice strong IT background or at least some knowledge is really beneficial to keeping everybody that you work with engaged. Um, it it kind of changes the conversation a little bit. So it's been a great learning experience. So today we would like to, uh, we're gonna cover uh, some basic objectives. Um, we're gonna get into uh, stuff like, <clears throat> pardon me, how your data governance policies add value. This is gonna be a real strong spot for trying to sell, pushing data governance out into your environment. <clears throat> pardon me, sorry. <laughs> Um, we're also going to cover where to start and how to prioritize your, your efforts, um, how to get leadership support. Leadership support is going to be key to having adoption across your organization. Um, we're also going to cover topics like who your target audience is, who should I be talking to, uh, and also how to manage the change. Change is going to be a big portion of ensuring that people know what's going on and have a comfort level with what you're pushing out to everybody. Um, so we'll start with a quick quiz, a quick question. What is the first thing you do when you get in your car? Anyone? So, right. Typically, we'll put it on our seatbelt. So why do we put on our seatbelt? Well, it's the law to start with. Beyond that, it's a standard that all vehicles have a seatbelt. But beyond those key elements, you also have the value of that seatbelt can save your life. <laughs> so, when you build in a value component to something you're putting out there, it makes adoption that much easier. And you start to move people from an action to a behavior. And that's what you want to do. Instead of people actually having to think about, I have to do X, Y, Z, we want them to say, this is what I have to do because it's the right thing to do. So, ultimately, what is a data governance policy? Well, by definition, it's a set of documented guidelines to ensure an organization's data and information assets are managed consistently and appropriately. That sounds pretty simple, but um, ultimately, the, the amount of data that is created and collected every day has exploded over the last decade. Uh, this promote, this it gives us an opportunity and a challenge in the realm of, of data governance and ensuring that our 
uh, our data assets are managed properly. I'm sorry. <laughs> Grab a drink. Thank you. Yes, it is. Man, I'm not having a heart attack. I swear, I'm just sweating. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, at the end of the day, though, your data governance policy is going to be the glue that binds all these activities together. Um, without a strong data governance policy, uh, you're going to struggle with your foundational activities that branch out from there. So it is very important to ensure that your policy or policies are concise, simple, and easy to read in a business context. Huh. So, um, who can give us a couple examples of how data governance policies add value to your organization. Anyone? And for instance, um, how about we set clear expectations for our associates to work under? This allows everybody to make common, founded decisions that are within the guidelines and guardrails of the organization. Um, or maybe even how about strengthening or instituting best practices? These are a benefit for the organization and employees alike. So these are some of the foundational cornerstones you want to leverage for your data governance policies. So how about some other possible benefits that we have? We've got all sorts of options up here. Good quality data. Um, you know, obviously, with a mentality of garbage in, garbage out, if you're basing your analytics off of bad data, you're getting bad results. So part of the goal of having a policy is ensuring that the data you're working with is actually accurate. Some other uh, policy values we add, improving employee performance. When you start to look at some of these items, you start to see where you're really hammering into the bottom line of trying to figure out where these policies add value. Where are you going to see a return on your investment? Things like improving uh, financial performance. Always big hitters with people that are looking to sign a check. Um, and again, setting clear expectations. You can't do a good job if you don't know what a good job looks like. So through our experience, and obviously what we just went through, we did want to go ahead and share a couple quick items with how to navigate and get to a point where you're comfortable with and your policies reflect your ultimate goals. Why? Why are we creating data governance policies? Well, we need them for regulatory reasons. Uh, we need them just for sustainability and for company growth. <coughs> uh, we also uh, focus on who should be involved in this process. Uh, you really need to get out there and talk to your subject matter experts. In order to build something effective, you really need to know how to encapsulate all those activities and not impact your business in a negative way. Uh, we'll also talk about what. What should be included in your policies? <laughs> Again, one of the things we try and hammer on is the fact that when you're writing a policy, if nobody understands that policy when they read it, it provides no value to your organization. So ensure that what you're writing makes sense and make sure it's relatable in a business context. And then how? This is a lot of work. <laughs> you're going to have a lot of meetings with a lot of people who don't fully understand where you're going, what you're doing, or why. So when you're pushing this out into the environment, it's your job to articulate this in a way that matters to the people most affected by it. So, uh, and then also, one important thing to keep in mind is that governance is never static. Um, like Scott had said earlier, uh, this isn't a project. Uh, this isn't a start date, end date. This is a program that you get into in earnest and you stick with until you feel you're comfortable and managing uh, your data properly. So, um, and with that, I think I'll turn it back to All right. my co-pilot. <laughs> All right, thank you. I don't have a radio voice and I'm not going to walk down those steps because I'm sure I'll fall down. <laughs> if you don't mind, I'll just stand here. I am wearing heels so you guys can he see me behind the podium. <laughs> I'm a shorty. <laughs> All right, so let's move forward to the step number one. Let's start with why your organization 
needs, the data governance policy. This is your planning phase. You know? This is where you get to identify expectations, wants, and needs of your business stakeholders right now. Not tomorrow, not next year, but what are their pain points today that the policies should address? So the word right now is a key you know, to be sure that your policies are effective. Now, this can be accomplished via interviews, one-on-one -on -one meetings, or even informal, um, informal uh, talks, like in the hallway, okay? Um, be sure during those talks that you, you communicate the value that the business policy brings to your key stakeholders and their areas. Now, you have to talk to the stakeholders, you have to talk to your leadership, and start securing their buy-ins at the same time. This is going to help you during the implementation phase later. Believe it or not, they're going to become your ambassadors during the state, and trust me, you're going to be best friends. So, um, next. The next on our map to success is the who. Who should be involved in the policy process? Now, you heard a lot, if you've been here yesterday, during some presentations, and throughout this conference, you will hear a lot about getting executive sponsorship. And it's not an easy task, trust me, but it's a very important task. And it, you know, success of your data governance policy implementation will rely on that. Your executive sponsor or sponsors, you can have multiple, will open the doors for you and remove the obstacles throughout the whole process. Now, here's a few suggestions that we have on how you can um, get that executive sponsor to buy in. Try to connect your policy um, with the company's strategy or vision. Find some kind of initiative that your executive is already involved in, right? He already committed the time, the money, the resources, and see if you can build your policy work into that you'll have much easier time getting the sponsor to agree to support your policy work. Now, as you're talking to your sponsor, again, talk about the values. Remember what Neil was talking earlier? Explain how the policy will affect his or her area. Answer the question, what's in it for him or for her? And try to attach the dollar signs to it. Our executives, leaders, they love the dollars. You know, and if you can do that, they will help you throughout the way. Now, however, not having an executive sponsor is not an excuse, you know, not to start your work on the, on the policy. What did I do? Huh? Uh, yeah, I, I hit happened? something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was you. It has to be me. I always break <laughs> stuff. <laughs> but we'll continue in the meantime. So not having the sponsor doesn't mean don't start working on your policy. Continue your work and then use the process later to get the executive sponsor, you know, throughout the processes. Now, after you get the executive sponsor or not, you know, you need to identify the key stakeholders that will be helping you throughout the process. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And those six Key stakeholders can be your data consumers, data owners, legal department, information security, all right? They will be all your best bodies by the end of the process. I can guarantee you that. Now, um, be sure to involve the right people. Do not do it on your own. That was one of my biggest fears when I got this assignment, like, oh my Lord, <laughs> am I starting to write all the seven policies on myself? No. You create this, um, build a cross-functional team and for each policy, and you create the work groups for each policy, and they will be your biggest support throughout the whole process. And believe it or not, at the end, and I have some key stakeholders, I didn't even know it, that not only they help in to spread the word and teach everybody within the organization about the policies, they're actually helping them to go through the process, to fill out the forms. You know, they're providing training behind our backs. It's like, this is wonderful. That's why I'm saying you have to create those relationships early on, get their buy-ins, and then it will be easier. Because if the, your stakeholders understand why this policy is important and 
how it's going to help them, then it will be so much easier for you to get the sign-offs on the policy when it's time to get the sign-off. Now, once you get those folks identified, you definitely need to assign them roles and responsibilities. And you're going to be hearing these words throughout the conference as well. Not all the stakeholders will be actively involved in building every single process, but you be sure you empower them to provide valuable input and participate, you know, somehow through the process. Now, who knows what a RACI is? Okay, great, about half of the room. So you can take a nap. I'll explain what it means for those who have no idea. Now, to identify roles and responsibilities, one of the you know, best practices that I'm aware of is the RACI matrix. The RACI is an acronym for responsible, accountable, um, consulted, and informed. Now, responsible parties are like your working bees. They'll be the one doing most of your work. You know, uh, they're going to be um, creating those workshops. You know, getting those work groups together. They will be writing the initial draft of the policy, keeping a track of all the changes um, that you will be discussing throughout the iterations, creating the final version of the policy, and providing it to the Data Governance Council for the final review and approval. Each task should have at least one R, but it can have multiples. Now, the next ones are accountable people, person. <laughs> the accountable person is the owner of the task, and this person's responsibility is to be sure the task is completed. Okay? Each task must have an A, but it can only have one A. You only want one chef in the kitchen, right? And just to let you know, the responsible people can one of the irresponsible people can also be unaccountable. So you will see in the example that some tasks have R and A together. The next ones are consulted. These are the parties, uh, these are kind of like your subject matter experts, SMEs. They're the ones who will provide you the valuable input throughout the process because highly likely uh, they have the expertise in the specific domain that is affected by the policy. Now, your informed folks don't have to participate. They, you know, they don't care about the process. They don't do a lot of work. They're there to be informed of the final decision. Why? Because their areas will definitely be affected by the policies and they need to be sure that they're following. So the next slide is an example of the race matrix that we used. Remember how I told you you have to talk to the business to identify their pain points, what are you going to write about policies, right? What are we going to address now? And this is the area on the left side. We address data collection, data storage, data access, data use, and data sharing. This is just some examples to help you get started, okay? Now, and then to each area, you identify activities. Let's look at the one in the middle, access. We have two activities. One was to establish an, um, a, a policy and create a process for granting access to the third-party vendors, okay? And the next one was actually, actually to review the existing procedures about quarterly access reviews. Then you identify the roles, right, on top. And are, you know, parts of the organization that are going to be helping you throughout the process. Once that's done, your matrix is ready, you can start to fill it in with your A's and your R's and your C's and your I's. All right? Once this is ready, be sure you share your matrix with your teams and with all stakeholders. Otherwise, they have no clue who is responsible for what, right? Now, since you identify the people who are going to help you through the process, what are we going to include in the policy? What do we need to write? And um, I heard yesterday, and it was a nice reminder because I keep hearing this as well, that the data governance should actually be called people governance. Have you heard that? And that's because the data governance, you know, is about changing and affecting habits around people's behavior, like around the data usage. And your policy, should definitely reflect that objective. Now, how much detail should you include in the policy? Varies on your organization and what you do in your organization now. And the best way to figure that out is to look at the organization and policies that you have now. You see what details they have and how long it is. 
Now, a little side note, <laughs> if it's too long, don't even look at it. <laughs> you know, my recommendation is to keep policies simple, focused, and short. If they're more than two pages long, nobody's gonna read it, and you will have a very hard time implementing it. Now, be sure that the policy is, uh, uh, tailor your policy to your organization based on what's important to your business now. Remember, we talked about it earlier. Avoid the common mistake. The policy should include what? What shall you do or not do with the data? Don't include what, how, because that's what your procedures are about. They can be as long as you want, and they describe what steps should be taken to be sure that the policy is followed, that what in the policy is met. Now here are some examples of the major sections that the comprehensive data governance policy may have. The purpose. Why does the policy exist? And how it supports the business objectives. Just simple. Now remember, that can change. As your organizational needs change, new laws come out, now your business model changes, um, the data governance involves, evolves, you can adjust the policy as needed. The scope. You explain who this policy affects, right? Uh, applicability. Definitions and acronyms, that's my favorite. I highly recommend not to use the acronyms, but if you have to, you know, do yourself a favor, do your associates a favor, and describe what they stand for. Now, as far as definitions, keep the format and the definitions consistent throughout all the policies. Now, this way, everybody in the organization will be able to interpret it the same way, the way you banned it when you wrote it, right? And it will be easier for them to follow it and adhere to the policy. Um, if you cannot use a simple language when you write the body of the policy, that means you don't understand it well enough yourself. So find somebody who can help you because use it the simple definitions, the simple language in the policy in business context is the key for the effectiveness of your policy. Now, I know data policies are not easy to create, but hopefully we'll give you some additional information that you, you know, can find useful. Now, this slide was borrowed where we did the research, but we thought it was important to share with you. Data policies must be practical, and I mentioned most of this already. Make your policies important by writing this in business language that anybody can understand. Remember, your associates probably don't speak legal language, they don't speak IT language, but they speak day-to-day -day language, so know your audience, relate to them, use the simple language, like I'm doing right now, <laughs> because English is my second language, so, and they will be easier to interpret it for them. And make them compliance measurable. You don't know if your policies are effective or not if you don't measure them, and we'll give you some examples later how to do it. Influence data policy ownership by identifying and limiting the scope for each policy. Remember those roles and responsibilities? That's where you should include it, but keep it short. So where to find examples of the policies? Like I mentioned earlier, your best bet is to start with the policies that already exist in your organization. But remember, well, one thing I notice is in some organizations, the policy is siloed in different departments, which often written by different, you know, you're shaking your head, by different people, which means they use different format, they use different definitions, they're very inconsistent and hard to find. So as you decide on the format that you want to use for the policies, maybe you can use this opportunity to look to rewrite the other policies, right? Try to include, I mean, try to implement consistency along the organization. And don't stop, stop just rewriting it. Consistency should also include the location of your policies, right? Try to bring them all together into one location. Hey, did I pay you to say yes all the time? I love it. <laughs> Try to bring the policies to one location so it will be easier for your associates. No, don't stop. <laughs> to find, you know, the resource that they're looking for. Okay, so, and of course, online. 
who doesn't Google stuff, right? There's tons of policies available online. And the best, what we found is that the best websites are the governance and universities, okay? But the, do yourself a favor, I suppose to tell you, use it for inspiration, but trust me, I cut and paste quite often, but be sure you adjust that policy to your organizational needs. Or at a minimum, can you just change the title, like on the organization name? Because I've seen people not do that. Okay, now you think, all right, I wrote the policy, I have, you know, everything looks good, now what? Believe it or not, the hardest part is to implement the policy and be sure that everybody understands and follows, which means managing the change. And you know managing the change is quite a task on its own. And thanks to Neil, this is when he came on board and really helped us. Now make no mistakes, policies and procedures are not cure for all, okay? Just because something exists in the policy doesn't mean that your associates will be able to understand it and follow it. No matter how great your policies are, they're not a replacement for good communication and training. So employees need to understand not only what's in the policy and what they should or should not do, but how it, impact, it impacts them and their areas. And here's the steps that you can take, right? Communicate the value to business users and leadership from the beginning. Remember those interviews during your beginning stage? We always talk about value and we never stop, right? That's how we get in the buy-ins. That's how we get in the ambassadors. Involve the key stakeholders in the policy creation and seek the endorsement. Utilize those executive sponsors, if you have them, to evangelize the policy because what can they do for you? They eliminate those you know, uh, obstacles and open the doors for you. Now again, communication is the key, but there's no single mechanism to communicate your policies because there's different audiences. Somebody prefers email, somebody likes text, somebody doesn't like either one. So try to use them all, right? Attend their department meetings and ask those department leads to do presentations. That was very successful for us. Do some mini training sessions, definitely use communication, send emails. If they don't read it, what's on them? At least you try it, right? We also created some short videos and with this radio voice short messages, and they were very successful too. And definitely tap into the training opportunities within your organization. And if you think you're done, I created the policy, I implemented it, you're wrong. <laughs> you have to govern the policies. Now, um, remember how I told you, you don't know if you're effective if you're not measuring it, right? So, um, if you want to measure your success, be sure to define metrics. But do it for the short-term and long-term measurements, right? And measure the results often. And try to share even the small wins with your stakeholders and your leaders. Something to celebrate, something to show them that the policies actually bring the value to your organization, okay? Review and update the policies, like I mentioned, regularly, and keep it relevant. Communicate the policy changes once you make them. Right now we're going through that phase because of the new Virginia data protection law that just came out. We have to be sure that we're compliant because we do business in Virginia. So we're revisiting the policies. And be sure the policies are implemented across all applicable domains and that you establish those processes that folks know how to follow the policy. Now reinforce the policies through the annual mandatory training, just to keep to remind folks what they should and should not do around the data, okay? And the more you talk about it, the more it becomes a habit. Remember, this, remember the seatbelt example that Neil was speaking about? It's a habit for you. You don't even think that, oh, it's a law, right? We want to do the same with the data governance policies. So a couple of the key takeaways. Um, Understand the environment you have now, not the future state. But do not define the policies against how you work today because you will not be able to implement it. Remember, you can change it later on as your data governance matures or the organization business needs change. Understand the business challenges that are driving the need for policy. Identify the topics 
you know, identify of the interest for business, identify their needs. What should you address in your first phase with the policies? Create cross-functional working groups. Remember all those SMEs and roles responsibilities? Don't do it alone, use them. Have a draft policy ready for review. And I'll tell you why. Did any of you ever take the maze, um, you know, did the maze where you have to start from the beginning and you have to get to the middle or whatever, the end? I always do it backwards. I start from the end, or you do, do exactly. Yeah, and it works, right? <laughs> it, exactly. It limits the possibilities, the solutions, and you come to the solution actually much faster. Do the same with the policy. Create that draft, okay, and come to the stakeholders during the first workshop, and this way they'll start discussing it and reviewing it and proposing changes right away, and you will get to the end result much faster. Now, and don't include the how. Remember, the policy should only include what we shall and shall not do. And refine the policies as they, mat as they mature. And there's one more thing. Don't forget about communication and the training. And if there's only three words they're going to remember today about the policy, do yourself a favor and remember simple, short, and measurable. Thank you. Okay, we have about 15 minutes, which is exactly how we planned, for any questions that you may have to us. Hey, I didn't give you enough cookies. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, actually, just going to the measurable part, um, it's really nice to implement policies, but how do you track the enforcement? How do you enforce it, and then how do you measure it? Do you want to take it? Sure. So yeah, I mean, it's strange. It's hard to to wrap metrics around things like policies. It's not that this tangible thing. Oh, I did this many requests today, et cetera. So you try and build in uh, those measurements into. Um, so say your policy is mandating, uh, or say your policy is uh, indicating that you handle your data X Y Z, because what you found was when it wasn't, you had data errors, either duplicity, uh, lack of data, whatever the case may be. So from there, you can kind of extrapolate, okay, I can look at a data quality element and say, I've lowered my, my data quality risks um, through the advent of this policy. Uh, you have to try and look at it in a, uh, uh, I don't know, I lost the word, but um, you have to look at it in creative ways to try and find where you can attach a data element to an intangible. Like I said, when you get in the data quality elements, you can measure where you failed your data quality sets. Um, you know, likewise, uh, other lines of the business, you can start to look at your maturity model by looking at how many people, uh, so for us, when we started to push out data literacy, uh, we didn't do a pre-assessment on everybody. So we put together training modules and we said, we're gonna start everybody here. And then we walked them up through the process of knowledge. Um, and what we found is, you know, the more people adopt, the more people talk, and the better they do with these things. Now, you know, in your environment, again, this is all very unique to each individual company, but you could do an assessment. Baseline, where your staff are figure out what they do and don't know. And then through uh, you know, maybe annual assessments, figure out if they're picking up that knowledge. And from there, you can use that to change your needle. Do I need to focus here? Do I need to focus over there? Does that so help? All the examples I can add is you can measure how many people actually have taken your training classes. Right, and I don't know if you want to do some kind of rewards that were mentioned earlier today around the, was the data literacy, you know, you can create a certificate and say, hey, you passed this course, you know. So that's one of the measurements. The other one, one of the examples around the data access is we do quarterly access reviews, right? So we have to, we can measure that, how many reviews were done, how many of them were done on time, how many, you know, accesses have we removed. Uh, there's all kinds, and data governance effectiveness is not easy to measure, right? Especially to quantify that is very hard. And there's actually the whole workshop on, you know, how to do that the right way, how to create that metrics, how to know about your wins that you can share with your stakeholders. Yeah, to your point, it's 
everybody's different, and so mm -hmm. that's what makes it more complex yes. to measure. Right. Because you're saying these are the policies that we're implementing, and the question's always about how are you going to enforce it, mm -hmm. and how are you going to know that the enforcement is working. Absolutely. Yes, we can do it through measuring data errors, um, data quality errors, um, you know, business rule changes, things of that nature, but I'm just thinking more high level from a policy perspective, yep. saying here's the way that you are to use data, Right? It's like, okay, you're talking about data usage, yeah. how is that yeah. policy enforced? Data usage is good. Can you guys hear in the back? Or do you need me to repeat? You're good. Data usage, data quality is not good, but policy is not just about that, right? right? How about those compliance? You know, you can measure the risk. That's a very simple one to measure. The risk of uh, losing the data, the risk of folks accessing the data that shouldn't have the rights to access the data. And um, also, you know, some other things you can uh, go after at times is uh, looking at your threat footprint. The more data you have sitting around collecting dust, the larger exposure you have. Uh, so if you can, like, for instance, with us, uh, we, we've been going through and getting rid of data that's older than X number of years old. Well, that turns into a, a value that we can actually show to somebody. 1.7 terabytes of information has been removed off of our network. You know, we can give people some hard line numbers like that. And, you know, interestingly, the more regulated you are, the easier it is to kind of uh, cherry pick out individual metrics that you can kind of pull from. Mm -hmm. Use the, the guidelines that you're bound to as your reference material to figure out what I, I can report on to show value. You could, we actually brought up a good point about the data retention policy that we've been battling with the business. <laughs> Our business, some parts of the business keep want to keep forever. data forever. Because of the cost to retain the customer is much lower than the cost to bring the new customer on board. So they believe even if the customer hasn't been shopping in our stores for 10 years, they still want to keep the data because what if this customer finds that loyalty card you know, somewhere in the closet and decides to come back and shop with us. Now, we're trying to teach them, yes, data brings the value. It's the most valuable asset that the organization has until it becomes a liability. So we have a very close partnership with our legal department and information security. And we're actually asking for the advice quite often. Now, definitely we're making the final decisions that we have to share with the business. But they're advising us, no, we don't want to keep data forever. Hence, there is a reason that we created one of the policies was retention policy, which included the retention schedule. And now we're training everybody around it. How do you measure adherence to that policy? Go into every single application and see how many years of data do they, do they have. Is it seven years or is it more? If it's more, you have to work with them. Actually, being able to map out data lineage also helps um, because you can start to see your data creep throughout your environment. And that on a roadmap can translate pretty easily as well. One more question around that. Okay. What system do you guys use for, for data governance right now? <laughs> we have Honestly, multiple. Yeah, we I'm actually use say. the IBM. Are we allowed to say that? Use IBM? Okay. Yeah. We use IBM. We switch into Microsoft. Yeah, well, uh, we just recently started uh, uh, in with Purview, and uh, so yeah, we're, we're kind of in a transitional phase of sorts. Um, and also, we're still in really kind of our infancy, if you will. So uh, that's one of the cool things about, you know, I loved landing uh, with this organization because it gives me a huge opportunity to grow. Like I said, previously it was all IT, so I had no idea, you know, the whole battle between IT and business that's been going on since like the dawn of time. Um, it's really cool to be on the other side. Uh, so it, I found it hugely beneficial and it's great to keep that mindset when you're talking to everybody because you can talk to the IT side of the house, you can talk to the business side. Yeah. Of the and we both side. have that background, IT and business, which is wonderful. So. And to add to the tools list, we're actually in the process of evaluating and finding a tool for data privacy, which has a lot of, a lot of metrics built in it, yeah. you know. With this new Virginia law, we just have the need to have a tool. So. Uh, by the end of this year, we'll know which one. Yeah, so, I mean, uh, I think there was a question there. Go ahead, please. Yeah, so data governance is relatively new within our, within our organization. So what we're discovering is that we have more establishments, so for example, InfoSec, privacy, compliance, policies. I'm curious on what your perspective is. What guardrails have you set to say these are the policies that we own in data governance versus policies that own by Information security or other. Or, you know, privacy. Do you take over all? Like, mm -hmm. what, are, what are your guardrails? Mm -hmm. 
guardrails you established. Cool. It sounds like he has an they, answer. They need to learn to coexist. Um, I mean, so from an information security perspective, they're looking at things like, can people get into my world from the outside? Uh, internally, am I, am I compartmentalizing my data properly? And I'm, am I ensuring that people can only access the proper things? With data governance, we're saying, okay, we're not taking into account at a, uh, I'm gonna say an infrastructure layer, we're going, oh, okay, they can get access to this folder. We're looking at more of a, I'll say existential, but we're, we're looking at a, a higher level wherein you're saying, what is the appropriate use of this data? Um, and with my role within an organization, should I be looking at that? Should I be using that? And moreover, one of the big things that I took away from yesterday was <clears throat> ethical use. You, know, you won't find anything with ethics in the InfoSec world. It, it's very binary. Yes, no, okay. Uh, when you get into data governance side, it becomes a much different animal, if you will. And it does get a little more difficult. So, but nevertheless, they do need to coexist. And this is, again, where you have to communicate with all the other uh, arms of your organization to ensure you're coming up with an effective, concise policy. And we always say, when in doubt, reach out to your yeah. responsible. Reach out to your stakeholders. Have either of you encountered pulling content out of another's policy? So, for example, because data governance, you know, if I look at our, some of my lanes, they're further ahead. It's yeah. So I'm curious if you've ever had that negotiation of here's why it comes in. Part of it's an education on what data governance is and trying to bring data governance off. I mean, yeah. experience that I need to pull this to further establish data governance. It's Not funny you mentioned. It's funny you mention it. Um, a few weeks ago, was asked to review. We are an international company, but our data governance office covers the USA only, and we have counterparts in, U in e European Union. So we work very closely with them. A few weeks ago, I was asked to review one of their uh, global policies and provide input. It was over 30 pages long. So speaking of pulling information out, my only recommendation and, and actually feedback was, it's too long. Subdivide it into multiple policies, remove that, that's a process, this is a procedure, you know. I took it apart. So yeah, it's a great question. And it's also a great opportunity to help ensure that you're all speaking the same language, you're all framing things out in similar fashion, you're all, it's very, it, it, it benefits everybody yeah. for consistency across how policies are given out to the world. It, it genuinely does. Yeah, keep it simple, keep it short, keep it measurable. Uh, there was a question in the back of the room. Can you hear? Uh, we, we can't hear, is Sorry. it? Sorry, we don't have a mic. Uh, oh, oh, here's loud. Um, what are a few assets that you track the uh, tag of policy? Apart from like standards and controls, have there other areas that you look at that you track that you have a lot of assets that you Did you hear? Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, obviously, our key focus is the biggest asset that we have, and that is the data. Is, is the, I'm not sure I'm fully understanding your question, I'm sorry. I, I'm actually the same, I couldn't quite <laughs> grasp it. Actually, those who sit closer to that young lady, did you hear the question and can you address it maybe louder? Yeah. What she's asking <laughs> <laughs> Love it. is, besides the policies and processes, what other assets do you attach to them? Hmm. Well, I can tell you one thing, I don't know if it answers the question or not, but if you have any other policies related to the policy or information related to the policy you're writing, be sure to include the links on the bottom. Can you think of anything else? <laughs> it's not an asset. Uh, it is an asset. I, I, policy I, is an asset. Yeah, I apologize because I'm really struggling with that. I'm not sure what yeah. other assets... Oh, we have uh, somebody. Thank you. Can you help us out here since we newbies too? <laughs> Thank you. Does that answer? But so we're asking where are your standards? How do you do that? Where are the requirements? Are they in the policy? 
Yes, they are. Yes. We do mention them at the bottom as, as a reference. So the standards sit separately, but we always reference to the standards within the policy body. Right, so your policy, any um, uh, external guidance, be it uh, standards, be it pr uh, uh, procedures or otherwise, you nest as a reference point at the bottom of the policy. So, you know, when I read through this policy, I get to the bottom, I say, okay, well, you know, what are the standards as associated to this? Click, boom, I'm taking over the standard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if there's requirements or otherwise, again, you try and make it as simple as possible by putting all your references. So uh, your policy is gonna sit at the top or depending on how you look at the bottom. You know, we were told, you know, keep it sexy. Well, you can build this huge, sexy house, but if it doesn't have a foundation, it's going to fall over. So your policy is going to be your groundwork, and you're going to nest in all your additional information into that policy so you can link out to it. Thanks, Neil. We're actually 55 seconds over time. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Thank you all very much. We included our email address on the first slide. You should have copies of all our slides. Yep. So, but the, this one, because I want you to memorize it. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all, all so right. much for attending our workshop, and I'll see you around. Have a good day.